Hello, everybody on YouTube. Praise the Lord. Welcome. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna read something here, and uh, I don't know about a year and a half ago or so, God got me on Psalms 91. We've talked about that. I've been doing it on off and on, off and on for the last year, a whole lot. I know everybody probably get tired of hearing it, but I want to read you something here on that. Dr. Lawrence D. Hufflin and the Hufflin Report. Repetition is perhaps the most important learning device known to man. Yes, preachers stay away from it like it was a plague. They think they have to come up with something new every time they preach. Repetition is how we learn everything from our ABCs to the multiplication table, from the formula of water to, to numbers of planets in outer space. My late friend Grant Rice told me over and over again, the fear of reputation is the curse of the ministry. Hmm. <laughs> I thought that was pretty interesting. <coughs> I am convinced that he was right on target. Recently, I heard a pitching coach say I have to tell my pitchers over and over and over again mm -hmm. to throw strikes, throw strikes, throw strikes, throw strikes. He has said you have to keep telling them and keep telling them and keep telling them before it registers with them. That was said with tongue in cheek, but it proves the necessity, the power of repetition. If God says something once in the Bible, that should be sufficient. But there, there are certain truths that God mentions over and over and over and over again. Why? Because we didn't get it the first time. I learned that in spades and with raising four sons back when I was in grade school, I got, I got it in time. We knew why. Repetition aids learning. Repetition aids learning. learning. The reason I mention this is because if you're a pastor and are in charge of a congregation, your people don't get it the first time you talk about something. You have to keep hammering it at them again and again and again and again. At the beginning of every summer, when I was a pastor, I preached my message on sins of the summer. Why? My people needed to hear it again. I always thought it was interesting to note that R.G. Lee preached this message payday someday scores of times at his Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. When he announced that he would be preaching that sermon, people would come from everywhere and pack the place out to hear the same thing. <laughs> so that's I wanted, I'm reading that because I wanted y'all to see why I keep doing this about Psalms 91. You know, we, we've, been, we've been kept in good health even as, as, as a, at the age we're at here on Sunday night will be what we've been doing. It's amazing how a lot of older people is getting in really bad shape. Yeah. And even younger. But we, we keep, I keep doing this over and over. So what we're going to do, we're going to go to Psalms 91. And you know, I told y'all when uh, I first started doing this, Lord laid on my heart to do it. Every time I do it, it seemed like every week or so I'd get, a, get something else that I didn't get before. That's what going to the, back to the Word and staying with the Word will do. Amen. So when you read the first verse of Psalms 91, it says, He that dwells. Well, what does that word dwell mean? Lives. lives. So when you read it, you need to say that. He that lives in the secret place. Well, we need to know what the secret place is. What is the secret place? The Holy Spirit in our body. And us in Him. Jesus. And I kept looking in the Bible and trying to find out what the secret place was. And finally, it was like the Holy Ghost said one day, look at Galatians. What it's saying, Galatians. The mystery, which is the secret, is Christ in us. And when I, I thought, oh. And so when I read it, I said, Emmet that lives in Christ and Christ lives in Emmet of the Most High shall live under the defense of the Almighty. Because that word shadow there means defense. And that's something the Lord showed me a long time ago. He said, God don't have a shadow to be bigger than him. There ain't nothing bigger than God. 
So that word shadow means defense. Well, if you stop and think about it, that's what he's talking about in this old psalm. We're living under his defense. Hallelujah. So when I read that verse, that's where I read it. And what am I doing? I'm, well, I'm getting some revelation or, or different way to see it for me. That's making it, me it, the word stronger in me when I read it and say it like that. Now, you may see a little bit different from you. We all got different personalities, and sometimes words can be as, as interchangeable. Like the word heart, it can be talking about your heart. Or it could be talking about your spirit. It's interchangeable to what what's going on and where it's, what it's talking about at the time. So see, you there's so much of the word, so many words that the word of God can be interchangeable to bring out a revelation to you. If you look over in the fourth chapter of Mark, about that uh, 12th, 14th verse, somewhere along in there, God said that the, the word of God was wrote where unbelievers couldn't understand it. You got to be a believer to understand it. So what happens is when you start studying the word, God starts giving you revelation on stuff that you will see a little different. You haven't seen it before. So in that second verse, it says, I will say of the Lord. I will say of the Lord. And I sit there one day, just think about that. I will say of the Lord. It's like the Holy Ghost said, you got to say it and hear yourself saying it. Mm -hmm. Listen to yourself say it. So I started saying, John, we got somebody at the door there. Ask him to come on in. Come on down. Come on in. Come on down. Hey. <laughs> so you need to say it. All right. Hear yourself saying it. And then he said, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. So I got to, and I, one day when I was really looking at that, I was going over that and I kept, and I thought, that starts off with I will say and ends in I will. It's the, the verse starts off and I will almost ends in I will. So I sit there and I said, I will say of the Lord. I will trust him. My will is to trust him and I will say it. Ooh, I will say it. I do trust him. My trust is in him. Hallelujah. I will say it. And I will trust him. I'll trust him even though he would slay me. Because he'd be doing it for my good. Can you really say that and believe it in your spirit? That he would slay me? Even though he would slay me, it would be for my good? Can you really say it and believe that in your spirit? We should. Because if he was to slay us, it would be for our good. He doesn't even want our toe to be stuffed on a rock. He doesn't really want us to suffer. Nope. So I say if we're going to be slayed, slay. <laughs> and, and that, and that, that slay, it, that slay, it, you could be just like the rapture. Right. All he did is just leave in his natural body. Yeah. So what he's saying there, can you trust me to do that? Well, see, if, you, if, you're, not in the, if you're not getting in the word, if you're not doing this over and over, to where it gets down in your spirit, you're really not going to trust him. I mean, let me put it this way. You know, the, the real love is telling people the truth. If you tell people the truth, you're really loving them. I want you to think about this. A lot of you out there on YouTube, I want you to think about this. Are you going to church and you're going once a week and uh, you feel like you've done your da daily, weekly duty? You ain't doing nothing else? Well, is that word living in you? Are you living in that doing that? It's got to be a relationship there if you're living in it and it's living in you. We got, and I've been to a lot of different churches and preach. And it's amazing how many Christians go to church like once a week and never do nothing else. And then you get in trouble and you wonder why. Well, I'm going to tell you why. Because you're not living in the Word and the Word's not living in you. There's no relationship with Jesus there. You may not like it, but it's the truth. You're going to have problems if you don't have a relationship. It'd be like a husband and wife. If a husband and wife don't have no relationship, none whatsoever, 
How, long, how, good, how, long, how much good is that going to do between you? How well are you going to get along? You can't. All right, let's go on. Hallelujah. I will say of the Lord and I will trust him. It's my will. And that third verse starts off, it says, Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler. And that means any darkness. And from the noise of pestilence. That means diseases, virus, germs, and infections. So when I read that word, this is where I read it. The word surely, if you go look it up, the best meanings on the word surely I found was no risk and no failure. Boy, that set me on fire when I got a hold of that. So when I read that, I'll say no risk and no failure. He will deliver me from anything of darkness and from any disease, virus, infection, or germ. No risk. No failure. No risk. No failure. Ha ha ha. No risk and no failure. I mean, when you, man, when that gets down in you, it's like, ah, ah, I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> got it. I got it. And then the fourth, uh, the, look at the, we'll make it shorter. We'll look at the fifth verse. It says, Thou shalt not be afraid. Yeah. So what he's saying there is, you cannot get in fear. If you get in fear, it's not going to work. You can't trust God to be in fear too. Fear is the opposite of faith. To trust Him, you have to do it by faith. Hallelujah. So, and you, fear is a spirit. We've taught on that and taught on that. Who's got authority over spirits? We have. God's give us authority. Luke 10, 19 and 20 says we have authority over all spirits. It didn't say some. It didn't say one. It said we have authority over all spirits. Mankind has. So if you have authority, what does authority do? Dominance. It rules. So in other words, you rule over all spirits. It's you know, if you, if you wanted to look at something in the natural, just think about if you had a business, you had like 12 employees working for you, and you never told them what to do. You never used your authority to tell them what to do. What would they do? What would happen to your business? <laughs> Wouldn't last work. long, would it? <laughs> Same thing in the spirit realm. You got spirits that's trying to bring stuff against us all the time. You have to use your authority against them. And what we've done mostly in the church is we pray for God to do something about them. And God's sitting up there waiting us to, on us to do something about them because he gave us the authority to do it. Yeah. You know, I remember I had a, a cousin. And he, he went to a Baptist church and he, he, heard, uh, he heard preaching every Sunday on being born again. That was it. Eternal life. He never heard really much else where he went to church. He went there, I think, in 19 years, and his pastor had been there 19 years. And uh, he asked me, he said, uh, he was retiring, and he said, well, come on, go, with, go over there. We're going to have eating, and I want you to meet my pastor. You never met him. So I went over there with him, and he preached a, he preached a sermon on eternal life. So we was going home. I asked him, I said, uh, Why did, I said, did you, did you know everybody at church? He said, oh, yeah. I said, was all them people saved? He said, oh, yeah. I said, why do he teach on eternal life? He said, that's what he always teaches on. <laughs> I said, that, that's why you don't know nothing <laughs> but eternal life. Now, you got that. See, he got eternal life. Why? Repetition over and over and over and over and over. You couldn't tell him he wasn't born again. You wouldn't, there's no way you was going to convince him of that. But when it come to knowing anything about what was coming against him in the spirit realm, he had no idea. He, Health? I don't know. All he knew was a doctor. You go right on down the line. That's the only thing he knew. Why? Because that's the only thing he was taught in church. And he was taught that over and over and over and over. Now, he had a big problem with fear in his whole family. <laughs> so the, they was in fear one time. I went down. I, I cast that fear out. And you could feel it leave. They went from being stressed out. I mean, they both was just about in crying. I mean, they were just hurting because of his son. Something happened with his son. He couldn't find him. 
And when I cast that spirit of fear out, automatically they put a smile on their face. You could feel the atmosphere change. They had no idea. And even after that, they, he couldn't figure that out. You know why? He never had no teaching on it. Praise the Lord. So you have authority over fear. Don't get in fear. Use your authority. Say what the Word says about you. Say it over and over and over again. And the more you say it, it gets down in your spirit. It gets, it'll get so strong in you, there ain't nothing can keep you from believing it. Amen. And that's the way it's worked with me. And then we'll drop on down to the ninth verse. And it says, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is your refuge, even the Most High, your habitation. What does the word habitation mean? Does anybody know? Where you live. So are you living in the Word and the Word's living in you? See, he's saying it works when you're living in the Word and the Word's living in you. When it's your living place, in other words. So you, you, if you don't never pick the Bible up and study it and you just go to church once a week and just listen to a preacher preach and you don't hear nothing else, how much Word is going to be living in you? How are you going to believe no disease can come on you? You can't. You ain't heard it. You ain't got down in your spirit. Now, you can, now, a lot of people hear some of it, and they get a head knowledge of it. What will head knowledge do with the word? Get you in trouble. So you got to make it your habitation, your living place. Then he said, 10th verse said, There shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. Do you know there's nobody in here that's got this and got it down in their spirit and believe in that? That the, that virus can come near your dwelling? You can't do it. If you got it in your spirit, it can't come near you. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's true. Hallelujah. Yeah. You 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 want a uh, you want a, a, a protection shot? Get you a shot of the word. <laughs> Holy Spirit jab. Yeah, get your Holy Spirit jab. That's right. And then the 11th verse says, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. How many ways will the Holy Sp the angels keep you? In all, ways. all of them. So if you go out there and mess up and do something wrong, are they still going to keep you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, now, if, you ain't had to, if you ain't got in the Word and made it alive in you, you won't realize that. You'll think, okay, I said something wrong to somebody and hurt your feelings, so God don't love me no more. He's not going to bless me. I just lost my blessings. That's where you start believing if you ain't careful. No. They're going to watch over you anyway. You know, I, I was uh, here what, about three months ago, I told y'all, I uh, was out in the yard and I was going to dig a plant up. I got that zoya grass in my yard and it's pretty thick. And I put the shovel in and tried to shove through it. I couldn't get it to go through it. So I picked my foot up and I was going to stomp on the, on the shovel and stomp it and break the, the grass. So when I, uh, when I stomped, I missed it and it caught my britches leg on that place on the shovel. And it throwed me forward. And I had a bunch of junk laying out there. And I was going forward. I was thinking, I said, ooh, I do, I'm going to fall in it, you know. And then I come to myself, I was bouncing off my back. I was like, I bounced like a ball. I just bounced up. And I, and I said, God dang, I said, that made them angels. That was the angels kept me. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, they will. <clears throat> there's no way I could have kept from falling forward on my own. And there's no way at my age I can fall flat on my back out in the yard and bounce up like a ball. I didn't even get up. I bounced up. I mean, I just come right back up. Never had a sore spot on me. Never bothered me. You don't do that at my age. It don't work like that. It does if the angels is keeping you. But see, what have I done? How, 
I bet you I've read that verse in the last year and a half. There ain't no telling how many hundreds and hundreds of times. I read it just about every morning here. And then I come, I mean, at the house, I come teach on it here. And I got another place I teach on it some. And I got another place I teach on it some. Said so just about for the last year and a half, I've been bringing that up. A lot. So what's it done? See, it's got down in me. You can't believe that I make me believe I ain't got angels protecting me right now. There's no way. I, there is no way I, don't, I won't believe that. You can't talk me out of it. I don't care what you do. I'm, you, I, it's there. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> Just like healing. I got it. I got the healing power of God working in me. Working. See, you got to get it working in you. It's got to be alive in you. It's got to be a living in you. What happens? You get up and get to walking like my sister Dottie here. <laughs> uh, okay, she's in this chair, but she ain't where she stays. She, you know, she uh, started to walking with a helping her. And then she got on a walker. She got where she could walk from the car on a walker. Guess what she done today coming in? Mm -hmm. She walked without that hand walker, without the wheelchair, nothing. Just holding on to Junju's hand, just laying up. Mm -hmm. Walked all the way in from the car right by herself. Doctor said she'd never walk again. Why is she walking? What, what's the biggest thing she's done? Believe. Okay. I told her to start saying, burden removing, yoke destroying, power of God, the anointing is working in me. She started to say that, and ain't no, how many times have you said that, Donnie? A million times? No, no, no. Why? It has got down in her. She believes it. You know, Lillian B. Yeoman, I don't know whether y'all ever heard of her, but she was uh, back in the turn of the century. She was a, a leading surgeon in a hospital in New York, and she got on drugs real bad, and uh, she was about to die. And uh, so she, she, she left the hospital, and she went and picked her Bible up. She got born again when she was a kid. Her mother and daddy was a Christian's. So she went and picked her Bible up and started studying it and got healed. God healed her. And her and her sister wound up with a two-story house, and she opened it up and called it a healing home. Anybody had a disease come there. And uh, they brought a lady that had uh, tuberculosis. And uh, Sister Yeoman carried her upstairs, put her in the room, and she sat down, read her Deuteronomy 28, where it says tuberculosis is a consumption, and it's a curse of the law. So then she carried over and read her in Galatians where it said, Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And she said, you see how you've been redeemed from it. You don't have it. You don't have it no more. And she said, I want you to sit here and say what Deuteronomy says about tuberculosis is a curse of the law. It's been given under the law. Jesus has redeemed me from the curse of the law, so I no more have tuberculosis. And she said, I want you to sit up here. And that was that evening and all night and say it. So she said she went up there before she went to bed and walked in there and I said, well, <coughs> how many times have you said it? She said, oh, about 10,000. <laughs> and said, <laughs> Sister Yoma told her, well, keep saying it. So the next morning, her and her sister sat down eating breakfast and said the lady come running out the top of the stairs up there and said, Sister Yoma, did y'all know that Jesus has redeemed me from the curse of the law, and I don't have no more tuberculosis. Says she's completely healed. Hallelujah. What'd she do? Repetition over and over and over and over. Okay, if you sit there, she started saying it that evening. She said it all night, and then the next morning, uh, say 12 hours, she said it, let's just say. When you go to a doctor and you sit in his office and then you go back in another room and you wait and then you go to a drugstore and spend money for drugs that's going to give you side effects and you do that two times, reckon you spent more than 12 hours? <laughs> I don't know why we don't try the word, but... It, the biggest reason why is because we, we can't get ourselves to believe it, to do that. It, it takes a lot of patience and a lot of effort to sit there that long. 
To her, to, don't tell you how many times she said it. It took patience and it took a while. She had to wait on it. I know when she first started doing it, we was up to why I was going up there and they was too. And she'd get on that little old machine and she'd sit there for an hour. She just could move on it. And she'd be, he had it wrote down on a piece of paper and she'd be sitting there saying it. Just barely could move. She couldn't hardly make that thing move. And then I noticed after about three or four months of doing that, she was doing this with her feet. And she could do it with just the right hand. Yeah, and then she got to moving her hand. <laughs> over and over, over and over. over. No. Repetition, repetition, repetition. And if, So he, the angel to keep you, it don't matter if you mess up, they're going to keep you anyway. If God sent them to keep you, they're going to keep you. It ain't about whether you mess up or not. It's about whether you can believe it. We all gonna mess up as long as we in this flesh. We're gonna mess up. We ain't gonna do everything right. Jesus is the only one that ever done it right. He's the only one that kept it and done everything like it's supposed to be done. I don't care how how much you read this word and how spiritual you want to get, you still gonna mess up. I'll guarantee you, you will mess up. So get over it. Just keep <laughs> believing. Then they said they will bad you up in the hands lest you dash your foot against a stone. They said, God saying, here I got so much many angels I've sent. They're going to keep you. They'll keep a plague from coming to your dwelling and you won't even let, they won't even let you hurt your feet no more. So what I started saying on that, I, I said, I got so many, and I done, I, when I'm by myself, I do things. I, I act on it. I said, I got so many angels around me, I can't even stomp my toe no more. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I just get happy. Can't stomp my toe. <laughs> Boy, that's good news. <laughs> Amen. See, make it good news to you. Sometimes you need to put some action in it. Just do something. What did David do when he was bringing the ark back? He got so excited, he danced before the Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You need to get excited about the Word. Mm -hmm. I remember Brother Hagin, he used to say, if you want the Word to work for you, you need to get excited about it. Sing it, shout it. Yeah, if you can, but if you, don't, if you don't start doing it, you can't get excited. You can't get excited about nothing you're not participating in. Mm -hmm. The people go to a football game, they may not be out there on the field playing football, but they, get, they start participating in it. And what do they oh, do? Yeah. Oh, they get excited. Oh, well, they get excited. Come to church and do that. <laughs> you know, you can't do that in church. A lot of churches, you couldn't do that. That'd be wrong. And I'm going to tell you what, God likes it when you get excited about the Word. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Then he said, Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the, and the dragon shall thou trample under feet. So he's talking about darkness. So any kind of darkness that comes against you, what you supposed to do to it? Trample it under your feet. What's the easiest and best way to trample it under your feet? Take authority. Authority. Take authority. Use your authority. And what we've done in the church so much and what we've been taught, and, I, and, then, and I've been there, I'm not talking against them, it's just all they knew is the best thing most pastors know. Pray about it. Pray about it. And then when we pray about it, most of the time we're praying for God to do something about it. And God's sitting there saying, I don't give you authority to do something about it. Why don't you do something? He's already paid for it. He's already paid for it. It already belongs to us. Pray the word back to him that you are healed. <coughs> yeah. The word says you are a healer. Yep. And that's the prayer. You are a healer. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Father, for complete healing. Yeah, it's already a done deal. See, and, uh, most, uh, a lot of Christians I've talked to, they don't understand that. But you was healed 2,000 years ago. You were saved 2,000 years ago. I've had people tell me, no, I got saved in 1980. I said, no, you got saved 2,000 years ago. I know when I got saved, you don't. <laughs> I said, you just accepted it in 80. Mm -hmm. We all got saved 2,000 years ago. You just happened to accept it. Same thing with healing. Jesus healed you 2,000 years ago. If you're sick, when you're going to accept it? 
when you get your mind renewed to the Word, really, if you don't get your mind renewed to the Word, it's hard to accept something. It, listen, I understand. I've been there. It's hard to believe something when your flesh is yelling one way and you try to try to believe it another way. <laughs> uh, it's not easy. <clears throat> I've been there. And thank God he's given doctors the knowledge and the ability to help us in some areas because so, sometimes Amen. we need it. Amen. I know here a few years back, my back got to hurting me. I, I hurt it. And man, I got in pain. I was in so much pain, I couldn't, I couldn't sleep in the bed. I had to sleep in a recliner. I couldn't get up and down hardly. I mean, I was, I was constant pain. And if I spoke and used my authority for about a week, I, man, I stayed on top of it. Wasn't getting no better. I mean, it was bad pain. So I told my wife that Monday morning, that Sunday, we got up Monday morning, I told her, I said, carry me to the hospital. She said, what? I said, carry me to the hospital. So I started, I, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, you got to help me. I done done all I know to do. And sometimes we just need to quit doing it and ask God to show us what we need to do. And I said, I need some help. What do I need to do? And it was, first thing I thought about was hospital. I said, okay, I'll go to the hospital. I didn't want to. But I did. She carried me up at the hospital. They run me through that machine, took an x-ray. Come back out, and the lady asked me, she said, what have you been doing? Have you done something different lately? And I said, well, I went fishing. And she said, uh, and uh, talked about it and said, was it your water rough out there? And I said, oh, yeah, we got in some rough water. She said, yep. She said, your cushions just come out between your uh, uh, braces in your back and all. And she said, they pushed against nerves. <laughs> And she said, you see that in older people sometimes we see that because your, your body ain't as strong as it was when you was younger. You still got war. And she said, when you get in them waves bouncing in that boat, it made them cushions come out. Well, they gave me a shot. And the cushions went back in. I was all right. Praise God. Thank God for that. Amen. So this so, you know, there's so many things. Just listen to your spirit. My back has not bothered me one bit since then. I mean, my back has really been good. Better than it was before. Hallelujah. So see, God used, God used the doctor to really help me better than I was. So don't, I'm, I don't want doctors to, or people out there to think that's watching this on YouTube that I'm against doctors. I'm not. But I'm going to believe God first. I'm not going to put the doctor first. I'm going to put God first. Amen. God's number one. That's what I do. I pray them Ephesian prayers over gods and nurses. I, before I go to them, I'm praying for them to have wisdom and knowledge to see and do things that they didn't know they could do even. Right. And uh, in the church, what do we do when somebody's going, going to the doctor and have an operation? We pray for the people. Well, you put in your hands, your life in the doctor's hands. The doctor's the one that needs the prayer. <laughs> We ain't been taught that, but it's the truth. I'd much rather if I'm gonna use a doctor and he's gonna he's gonna do something to me, I won't I want people pray it over that doctor, not me. I've already believed in God, and I'm already believing him the doctors go will be able to take care of whatever needs to be taken care of. I just need that God dog doctor to have some godly wisdom on what he's doing. Amen. Hallelujah. And then in the fourteenth verse says, Because you have set your love upon me, therefore will I d deliver you. I will set you on high because you have known my name, Jesus. Fifteenth verse says, He shall call upon you shall call upon me, and I'll answer you. I'll be with you in trouble. I will deliver you and honor you. God said He would honor us if we believe in this word. If we just get in and believe this word, He'll honor us. Boy, that's a, that's a powerful statement for God to tell us that. I'll deliver you and I'll honor you, Jesus said, because you believed him. Amen. Hallelujah. Then he said, with long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. You start believing this word, you'll have a good long life. Well, let's see, we just took a picture in here. How old? 82, 83. 87 and 86. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Long life. Hallelujah. They got long life. Doing good. 
We all walked in here. Yeah, every one of them walked in here. <coughs> Not this, we have stuff come against us. Every one of us does, but we go through it. We don't sit down in it. We go through it. Now look at Psalm one hundred and three. Reputation. Psalms 103. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Now that word soul, when I see that word soul, I put the word thoughts there. Because your soul is your mind, will, and emotions, which we'll be talking about later. And what's in your, what's in your mind? What you're thinking, your thoughts. What's your will? Whatever your thoughts, whatever you're thinking, your thoughts are. What controls your emotions? Your thought life. You ever seen people get real emotional, go to crying and have what I call a hissy fit? It's all because of their thoughts. <laughs> so when you see the word soul, I put the word thoughts there because that's what that's the biggest thing it's talking about is your thoughts. So he's saying, bless the Lord, oh my thoughts. See, bless my thoughts. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Glory to God. He said, bless his holy name with all that there is within you. Amen. And I have read that I don't know how many times and never stopped and done it till here a while back. And I stopped and I said, Lord, I bless your holy name with everything that there is within me. And I started saying it, and I said it over and over and over and over. And the more I said it, the stronger it seemed like it got in me. Oh, glory to God. Everything in me was blessing the Lord. Well, that's what he asked me to do. Most of the time, we just do like I did for years, just read over it. Just read it and keep on going. But it made a difference when I stopped here a while back and started doing that. Then the second verse says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, thought, bless the Lord, O my thoughts, and forget not all his benefits. And you know, I have read that for years, and I never stopped and really just sit, sit there and started thanking him for his benefits. What is, you know, start thinking about some of the benefits God's given us. What's the number one benefit? Eternal life. Amen. What's another benefit? He got us a mansion built in heaven to live in forever. And any one of these old houses is going to fall apart that we got down here. He's got a mansion for us to live in Amen. forever. Is that a benefit? <clears throat> Glory to God. What about air? Is air a benefit? What if God cut air off for a couple of minutes? <laughs> I bet you everybody would be thanking him for that benefit when it comes back home. <laughs> <laughs> Glory to God, thank you, Father, for the air. Everybody, everybody in the world will be going, thank you for air, thank you for air. And how many of us have taken that for granted? <laughs> yeah, we do. What about food to eat, water to drink? Is them benefits for us? What about cars to drive? Husbands and wives? I mean, just look at all the benefits he's given us. I mean, you can sit down and start, you start going over. What about your health? Walking in health, is that a benefit? Amen. I mean, how many times have you ever thanked him for it? <clears throat> See, I, ne I never did until here lately when I got into this, and the Lord started showing. This is what happened when you go over something over and over and over and over again. I, you know, I've read Psalms 103, you know, Say a hundred times in the last 30 years. But that's what I've done. I just read it and kept on going. Mm -hmm. No, you got to stop and make it part of you. You got to make it alive to you. It's got to be living in you. Man, I think he put, I got where I, I constantly, I'm, all the time now, I think about, thank you, Lord, for that benefit. Amen. <clears throat> then he said, who forgives all our iniquities and heals all our diseases. Now, is that not a benefit? Mm -hmm. Never have another disease. I had one before, but I'll never have another one. Glory to God. No more. Never again. 
Why? That's a benefit God has bestowed on me. Why? Because I'm obedient and I'm in the Word and believing it, making it life to me. Hallelujah. Then he said, Hallelujah. the fifth verse he said, Who satisfies thy mouth with good things, so that thou youth is renewed like an eagle's. And we've talked about that, how an eagle renews his youth. He gets old, his old beak gets beat up, his feathers get bolted. He goes up on the mountain, he gets up in a rock, and he beat his beak off and beat off him old molded feathers. And we got a naked, I call it, eagle sitting up there. That's an ugly looking thing sitting up there with no feathers and no beak. And he sits there and grows the beak back and he grows back feathers. And when he comes off that mountain, he's like a brand new eagle. He's like a young eagle. He's soaring. Glory to God. And that's what the word will do to us. And so what the Lord showed me on that one, you take the word and beat your flesh up, just like that eagle beat his beak off and his feathers. You take the word and beat your flesh up, keep it crucified. That's how you crucify it with the word. Beat it up. That's what I, I tell myself all the time, flesh, I'll beat you up with this word. You shut up and sit down. I'm going to take the word and beat you up. <laughs> Black and blue. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing when you think like that and go to talking like that, how it, how it, 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 it just gets, gets in you. Mm -hmm. So what happens now when my flesh acts up, most of the time, that's what I do. I say, I'll beat you up with the word, flesh. You better shut up. You better sit down. <laughs> you better straighten up, flesh. I'm fixing to put a beat on you. <laughs> now, that's good for me. I, that, that may not work for everybody, but that works for me. It's just a way of thinking. God, we're all individuals. We all got different personalities. So you have to take whatever works with your personality and use it like that. So when I think and talk like that, it, it, makes, a, it makes a big difference. And uh, for years, I've been saying th things like, my ground is, uh, this is holy ground. Ain't no bad seed can be planted in this ground. Bad seed gets planted in here, the anointing will destroy you at the roots. I'll not have a bad seed planted in my body. See, talking like that, why? I, this body's made out of what? Dirt. That's why seed, the Word of God is seed to us. It's gonna, it'll come up and produce in your life whether it's bad or good. If you let evil, if you let evil seeds be planted in you and you act on them, you, they, they're going to be planted in you. Evil will. If it's good, if it's godly, that's what the seeds be that's planted in you. You, you've got a free will. It goes through your mind. Whatever you want to let your mind dwell on and believe in, you have that choice. Yourself. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Then he said in the 10th uh, verse, said, He hath not dealt with us after our sins. He hath not dealt with us after what? And what do we do in the, most of the time in most of the denominational churches is repent of your sins every Sunday. Go to the altar and repent of your sins. And God just said he wouldn't deal with us after our sins. What does he deal with us with? After Jesus Christ, according to whether we accepted Jesus or not. He deals with us on that. God don't look at us in the flesh. He don't, look at, he don't see no sin. He ain't got no sin. God only sees us in the spirit. Your flesh can't contact God. Your spirit's the only thing contact God. God's a spirit. He's not a fleshly man. And when you start seeing that he don't dwell with you after your sins, what happens when you start seeing that and believing it? You get where you sin less. But the more you think about sinning, the more you repent of sinning, the more you go to sinning. Yeah. You're going to stay in condemnation. I, it's, I, it's, it's amazing how that works. And yet we don't want to believe it and see it that way because we ain't been taught that way. But once you hear this, if you keep hearing it, you'll get to the point where you understand that and see it. I, uh, after, after I got a hold of righteousness and faith and grace and uh, speaking this word over my life and all, my life changed tremendously even as a Christian. Got that much better. It, the, I, the less I had problems with anything. The less I had problems with my flesh, I, it just, everything works better. But the church wants to teach us, 
Don't sin, don't sin. And the more you tell somebody to don't do something, the more they're going to do it almost. <laughs> and then you have them repent of it. That makes it a little bit worse. Then they get in condemnation, fear, feeling unworthy, and that, they get even worse then. <laughs> now get out of it. What did Jesus say? He's, he, there is no more condemnation to them that are worse. In Christ Jesus. If you in Jesus, there ain't, it's gone. It's over with. Look at it that way. Start seeing it that way. And nor reward us according to our iniquities. In other words, he's not going to reward you whether what you do good or bad. Whether he moves on your behalf right now, whether it's good or bad. God's going to move on your behalf anyway because you've accepted Jesus. God's going to reward you according to Jesus. A lot of people have a hard time with that, but that's, I'll tell you what, I start, when I started to think in that way more, believing more that way, things got a lot easier and a lot better. I don't never think about sin no more. Only time I ever think about sin is when I do a Bible study or something and mention it like I'm doing right now. In, in my natural walk, I never think about sin. I never think about sinning. And I don't, I, as far as I know, I don't. To, you know, to amount to anything, I might, every once in a while I might not like something somebody does or something, but that don't mean you sinned. If you don't let it go down, if you don't let your wrath go down on, on you, it ain't considered a sin. I get mad about things every once in a while. I can get mad about some of this politician stuff, but I don't let the sun go down on me. I don't hold it, so it ain't sin to me. I can get so mad sometimes I would think... I, I, I'd shoot them. I'd shoot them. <laughs> I've thought that. I can't hit, you know. And then I said, I don't mean that. Bless them. I'll just turn it around. Bless Why? Because I'm, I'm, I'm keeping that flesh beat up. See, my flesh could go that way if I'd let it. Mm -hmm. And I can have that thought. Yeah. But I can turn it around. Well, it ain't sin to me. Right. Hallelujah. Then he said, uh, the 12th verse says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. So he's saying, as far as sins, they call it as far as the east is the west, as far as I'm concerned. In other words, God don't never see them no more if you're born again. You know who sees them? You and the devil. You know who gets in condemnation about doing wrong? You. You know who feels unworthy, gets in fear? You. You know what to get you out of it? Renew your mind to the Word and start believing different. Mm -hmm. Start believing the new covenant. Hallelujah. And then over in verse 20, he says, Bless the Lord, you His angels who excel in strength, and do His commandments hearkening unto the voice of His Word. So angels hearken unto God's Word. Well, who has the ability to speak God's Word? We do. So when you speak God's word, the angels are listening and they do it. So what if you say, well, I'm always broke and I always have car wrecks and I don't know what I'm going to do. I get sick all the time and have to go to the doctor. What's the angels going to do? Nothing. Because they don't have the right to make a choice. They can only do what the word says. Does the word say that? No, the word says they'll keep us in all our ways and protect us. So if you start saying, thank you, Lord, for sending them minister spirits, them angels to protect me. Glory to God, they protect me. Ain't that what it said in the first part of Psalms 91 we was reading? Yeah. So when you say that, what are you doing? They hearken unto the word of God because you're saying the word of God. I remember this uh, when I first come down here to Florida, I was living over there in Homosassa. I used to walk. This uh, older man, he would walk with me every morning. And uh, he was uh, Catholic, but he didn't have no word. He didn't know. He didn't, yeah, he just didn't know nothing. He, all he knew, he was a Catholic. And uh, he, would, he would ask me things about God, you know. And he said, yeah, every morning, he told me, he said, I look forward to us walking every morning because he said, I'm getting to talk to you about the Lord. You know, he said, I'm, I'm learning some things. 
So that had been going on for, I don't know, two or three months. And uh, I went to Port Ritchie. Well, he went with me. And we was coming back, and we was running along there uh, before we get to Wikiwaki. I think before you get to where uh, Woods, what's the name of that place? Woods on 19, that big subdivision. Sugar Mill? Sugar Mill Woods, yeah. It was before that. Anyway, I'm running along about 50, 55 miles an hour. I had this crew set, me and him just talking about Jesus. And I got to notice that up in front of me there was a transfer truck, and he was in the left lane and was going was turning. So the right lane was open, so I just was in the right lane, so I just kept on going. Then he, you know, just going to go on by him. Well, when I got about even in the back of this uh, the transfer truck, a lady in the SUV pulled right out into the right lane, and it had two little kids I could see. Well, no way. I was going to hit them. It was no way for me not to hit them. So I just run off the road. I didn't want to hit him. I just run off the road in the ditch, went by her in the ditch. And she went, wow, when I went by her in the ditch, run right back up on the road. And I looked over, he was white as a sheet hanging on the car like that. I said, did you see them angels driving that car? <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. I'm telling you in the natural, you can't do that. I said, you didn't even feel a bump, did you? And he said, it was a miracle. <laughs> yeah. What's protecting me? The angels. I mean, I went off in the ditch, went right by her. <laughs> she just, <laughs> I'm just a smiling. <laughs> you can't go off in the ditch going that fast and then come back up on the road out of the ditch like that. It don't work like that. Something's going on. Like he knew. It was, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. And he talked about that and talked about that. And I'd tell him, I said, you can send your angels out to keep take, watch over you. Mm -hmm. I do it every day for him. Every morning before me and John Jew get in the car and drive it. I say it every morning, angels. Watch over us, guide us, protect us, get us to our destinations in the vehicles, back and forth, and everything we endeavor to do today. Mm -hmm. I say that every morning. Now, does that mean you won't have a wreck or nothing? No. John Jew had a wreck right after I bought her a car. But now she's trying to learn how to drive. And she thinks she knows how to drive. So I was kind of letting her learn, you know. She, you got to let them learn after they get the license and all. She don't want to hear it. She, so, so I would tell her, I told her, she, she had a flat tire and she just drove on the flat tire. She didn't know what was wrong with the car. Rurt the tire, you know. So I told her, I said, every time you leave the house, wherever you're going, when you get there, you call me. So I know you got there okay. So that's what we started doing. Well, this morning, she left this house this morning, and it was just two or three minutes went by. Telephone rang, and it was her. She said, husband, she said, the car won't run. It quit. I said, do it? No, no, this is, that was the second time. First time, she called me after she got to work, and she said, uh, me need to tell you something. I said, what is it? Stop. And she said, uh, me, me hurt the car. I said, you hurt the car. She said, yeah. And she said, I said, you drove it. I said, you drove it on to work? She said, yeah. I said, okay. <laughs> she can't stand for me to tell on her. She, she has a, my wife wants her to be perfect. She doesn't understand that you don't, can't be perfect. Anyway, I go up there and look at the car. Well, she she took the whole right side of the car off. Fender, door, mirrors, all the way from one bumper to the other. Nothing on the right side. I said, what happened? She said, uh, in our subdivision, she's, her purse fell off the seat, so she bent over, get her purse. She said, when I look her up, nothing but a tree in front of me. <laughs> <coughs> well, I know what happened. She said, she said, she hit the tree, and she said, I don't know how come it didn't hit the middle of the car, it just hit on the side. Because she said, I was just looking at it, it was right there. And she wound up in a park in a people's yard about 40 feet, 40 yards away or so. It parked where you'd park a car. And <laughs> what happened when she saw it, it scared her. She stomped the gas. I know what happened. Instead of hitting the brake. Yeah. <laughs> because she's not used to using her feet 
This is what, the, and, and the words, it, it works a lot in the same way in the natural. She's not used to using her feet because in China, she drove a motorcycle and used her hands. All the stopping and going was with your hands. Well, now she's trying to drive a car using her feet and she ain't used to it. So when that happened, it scared her and she stomped the gas. So, you know, now she's learned about it. She don't want to do that no more. No insurance. You know how it got fixed? She paid for it. She ain't wrecked no more. <laughs> but that was our money, right? <laughs> that's, that's, called, that's called tough love on your wife, isn't it? But she paid for it and had it fixed. Maybe but she she's more careful now. She pays more attention now. She's real careful. You'll be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> she doesn't like for me to tell off. I, I've tried to tell her. I can't tell off on other people. I can only tell on us. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what word works the same way a lot of people's just like her on that stomping the gas probably because of using her feet they don't know how to use the word and you'll use it wrong if you ain't got it down in you yeah. if you ain't been studying it you try to believe something you can't believe that's like her stomping the gas on it we should have been putting on brakes So get this word in your word. When you speak it, it, it's real. It works. Just like stomping the brake on the car. It'll stop when you stomp the brake. You got to get the word the same way. When you speak it, something coming against you. When you start speaking and you believe it, it stops right there. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Look at Habakkuk, the second chapter. Uh, now let's go to Proverbs first. Proverbs 29. This is... This is something that's not taught a lot. You don't hear much. But this verse in uh, the 18th verse, Proverbs 29, uh, 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the word, happy is he. Do you know there's a lot of people that's got problems because they don't ever have no vision. You need a spiritual vision. And if, if it's... What happens is, if you have a fellowship with Jesus, you will have a spiritual vision. Everybody, I don't care if you fellowship with Jesus, you're going to be having spiritual visions. Now, you may not act on them or believe them or see it or know it or whatever. But if you fellowship with him and you praying, God has give, got you a vision of something to do. It may be to be giving money. It may be going feeding at a mission or something. It may, it may be just having a Bible study. It could be anything. It may be cooking and, and giving food away. It could be anything. God has got everybody that fellowships with him has got some kind of vision. And it may be a vision because you need help just getting healthy. He'll be showing you how in the word to do it. Now, let's go to Habakkuk, the second chapter. Proverbs 2. Habakkuk, second chapter. Oh, Habakkuk. It's right over next to Micah and Zechariah. If you're going from the Old Testament, the New is right before Zechariah. Oh, Ze uh, Zephaniah, I mean. In my Bible, it's page 1348. <laughs> Who's that going to help? <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, I've been, the biggest thing we've been, I've been trying to get y'all to see and want you to notice is repetition. 
So when you get a vision, I want you to notice what these verses in the back uh, back of says. Everybody there? What yeah. verse are you going to stay in? Huh? Chapter zero. Two, three, and verse two and three. Top of this verse, this is I wrote this. This is for me, and I gave y'all a little handout last week on that. It says, "Thank you, Father, for a hearing, listening, teachable, obeying heart." That's something we all need. If you want a vision to work for you, you just about going. You have to learn to do that. Then he says, second verse says. And the Lord answered me. Well, let's go to the first verse. I will, sit, I will stand upon my watch. What's he talking about when he says stand upon my watch? Guard your post. When you're praying. You, 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 you're fellowshipping with him. You're watching. That's what you're doing when, you, when you're fellowshipping with God and you're praying. You're and set me upon the tower. And will watch to see what he will say unto me. See, when you pray and you listen or watch it, however you want to call it, to what God's going to say to you. And when you fellowship with him, you should be listening to what he's going to say to you. Because what he says is way more important than what we say. And th now this is the way the Lord laid it in my heart to do, for me to see it. Now, it may not work that way for everybody, but that's the way I see it. What he was saying to me, and what I shall answer when I am, and that word reproved there, I went and looked it up, it means convinced. So what he's saying is, when you've been praying and you see it in your spirit, what you've been, what I've had you praying about, most especially if you've been praying in the Holy Ghost, you should be convinced and fully persuaded on what I'm showing you. See, that's in the spirit realm. We should be convinced and fully persuaded on what we're seeing in the spirit realm. When we pray and fellowshipping with God, meditating. And then he said, when you do, and the Lord answered me and said, when I was fully persuaded and convinced, write the vision and make it plain upon tablets that he may run that readeth it. So what he's saying is you need to write that vision down and read it is running with it. And you read it all the time. So when I first time I seen this was way back yonder. And so I had a vision God had given me. And he gave me a vision of me retiring from work early. Retiring with full retirement. And an extra bonus of money. Well, that, ain't, that is no way. I was working in the paper industry. They never had no early retirement. It's impossible. That can't happen. That's one of my things. I said, that's the most dumbest thing I could be thinking. I kept thinking and kept thinking when I pray. I kept getting that. So I finally, I just, I was reading that one day this. So I said, okay, I'm going to write it down. I went and wrote it down. That's what I wrote down. I'd get up every morning and I'd read it. Just what he said there. I'd read. And I would retire early. I'd, I'd retire with a full, full pay retirement with a bonus of money. So I'd get up and read it every morning. Seven years went by. Well, six years went by or something like that. And the company I worked for had an early retirement. And I didn't get it. But if, if I'd have got it, I wouldn't have got full retirement. Um, so a year later, another company bought the company out I worked for. And then they had an early retirement. And their early retirement, as much as the company I worked for, was full retirement. Nice. <laughs> and the Lord had had me put money in a 401k. I didn't know nothing about it. I just, I started putting, I felt in my spirit put 20% in there. I started putting 20% and I think they was putting 5%. And uh, one summer the year before I retired, they had, uh, wherever I had put it, I don't forget where it was at. Anyway, that summer it was in uh, uh, different countries, something about different countries financing in them. I got to make it up to 50% on my money on some of the other countries. And I retired with a bonus of money. Hallelujah. Just what I got seven years before. Now it took seven years. See, the word's true. When you get a vision, but you need to write it down and, and run with it like it's reading right there. And then if you look at the look at the uh, third verse, it says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time. See, the appointed time was that was seven years off. So if you get in a vision, you need to write it down. 
You need to believe it and you need to get up and read it every morning mm -hmm. and pray and, and talk to the Lord about it. Thank him for it. And the appointed time, it may be months, it may be a year, it could be seven years like that one was with me. But was it worth it? Yeah. And one reason I, I told the Lord, when he called me and told me, he said, I want you to teach a word. And I told him, I said, Lord, okay. I, I said, I got one thing I want you to do. I don't want to have to go to no church and expect them to give me an offer to live on. Mm. That's where I got that vision. It was after that I got that vision. I've never had to depend on the church giving me an offer to live. Is it worth it? Was it worth it? I just done what the Word said. The Word's true. I went to churches. I spent more money to get there than what I got for an offering. And that was okay. Why? Because God's taking care of me. Yeah. I had a motor home one time. I went to a church in it. Spent about three or $400 in gas going there and get, coming back. And got there and stayed two weeks. And they gave me a $150 offering. <laughs> that was okay. Praise the Lord. People got healed. People got set free. Yep. It was a little. They they brought a prayer cloth to me. Uh, well, they they come and and uh, told me they had a, 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 a lady had her sister was in the hospital and her baby was uh, they was wanting to abort the baby. Said the baby's head was about the size of a marble. It had an irregular heartbeat and it was known it would be a vegetable when it was born. And they was wanting her to abort it. And uh, so I give her a, a, took a handkerchief out of my pocket, laid hands on it. The anointing had been being in it all week. I said, you go and lay that on that lady's belly, and that baby will be born perfect. Nice. Three months, three or four months later, it was like it was like seven months pregnant or something. Three or four, five months later, whenever it was, might have been a little bit longer than that, the uh, pastor of the church sent me a letter. It said the baby was born eight pounds in perfect health. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Father. Just, just do, just believe in the anointing. Look what the anointing's been doing in her life. Amen. Yeah. See, you got to start believing in it. Let me say something about that. When I first came here a year and a half ago, this woman in, in a year and a half, when I first came here, the best word I can put for her is glum. She, you know, she had a, a sense of joy, but glum. The countenance when I came back here, you know, people come. Yep. She glows yep. with joy. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, I mean, I that I mean, it, was, it was it wasn't shocking to me, but it, it took me aback. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't. It just you, I mean, I, I'm choking up right now because it's, it's like like 180 degree turn. I mean. She, she was dealing with what she had. Two two started. years ago, so she couldn't even she couldn't even get out of that wheelchair. Yeah, I, well, I was here the first night she got up, and and uh, when Billy yep. Martin was here, yep. Dixon, and Billy Dixon was raising the whole You just wait; it ain't gonna be long. It ain't gonna be long. One day when you hear, one night when you hear, you're gonna be me and her gonna be dancing. Playing basketball. <laughs> <laughs> Because I have a tendency of uh, like wallowing in my situation, and I'm not looking past the situation. I'm not allowing God to work through that situation. So, so that that's like this is testimony to me when I watch yeah. and I see this joy. Okay, now that said, the vision is for an appointed time. And then what does it say? It says, "But at the end it shall speak." <clears throat> Well, what happened to me at the end of seven years? Boy, that vision I had is speaking to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and not lie. Though it tarried, see, it tarried for seven years. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I, you, you have to be patient. Patience is, and, and faith work together. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, if you can't be patient, a lot of times your faith ain't going to work. Because God's working with people and working with different things and uh, they won't listen. They're not doing what they need to do, so many of us, because we're not listening to the Holy Spirit. God may be working with somebody to do something that, that, that he needs them to do and uh, they may not do it. He, and he may spend weeks with them. Then he'll get somebody else and work with them trying to get them to do it. 
Sometimes, I, I remember when I started teaching, and the first time I started teaching, uh, it was in the streets at, at a 90-day program for people who've been on drugs and all. And after I went down there and started teaching, I thought, what am I doing down there? I said, Lord, why am I down here? And he said, because would nobody else come? <laughs> I said, well, thanks. <laughs> so there ain't no telling how many people he had tried to get to go down there. He ain't doing many, you know, and they wouldn't do it. Nobody wanted to fool with them people on drugs. Everybody can't do that. Everybody don't want to do it. And then he said, because it will surely, what does that word surely mean? No risk, no failure. Surely, no risk and no failure. It will not tarry. It'll come with no risk and no failure. And it did. The vision I had done exactly that. Well, see, I got another vision now, and it's been years I've been believing that for. And it's a, it's a church, and uh, it's a place to teach the gospel. And uh, I've already been teaching it. I taught in it. That's where I was having the Bible study for a while. It's got the sanctuary to teach the word. It's already got rooms set up in the back on one on, where the old sanctuary used to be. It used to be uh, Sunday school rooms. Already, It's already fixed to have a healing center. It's got a big dining room and kitchen on it. That's where we work. Yeah. yeah. And I asked the Lord one time, I said, Why I, how, did I wind, how did I wind up in a Presbyterian church? You can, <laughs> and the, the pastor comes to the first meeting and he said, Oh, my Lord, you too charismatic. <laughs> but he wouldn't tell me to leave. Why wouldn't he tell me to leave? God wouldn't let him. And if while I'm there, the Lord showed me. He said, this is already set up, which he laid on my heart 15, 20 years ago about healing schools because I was ministering in healing schools, about having a place to teach the gospel, having a healing center, and feeding people. That's the, the commission is to feed people, heal, preach the gospel. So the, the church has already been set up for it. God had them build it many, many years ago for it. It's already there. And what's it doing? Sitting there doing nothing. No, having no services. They ought to have it anything. They don't have any no. Sunday service at all. Just sitting there. Wow. So what am I doing? Same thing I did on this vision. And that's a vision. That's a, what he gave me. He kept stirring in my heart about that. So I'm just doing the same thing I've done and seen the vision come about seven Years later, I'm doing the same thing with that. It's an appointed time. There was a way on the Lord when we knew their strength. There were sore ones like Eagle and Walk and Uncle Larry and they were uh, running on our faith. That's exactly what happened. So you just, you know, you just have to get your vision and stick with it when yeah. you get it. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing. Okay. And I ain't no pastor, so I don't know how God's going to do that and what he's doing, but I ain't no pastor now, I can tell you that. <laughs> he'll give me the words. He'll give me somebody to be a pastor. I'll go do the feeding and the, and the healing son of they, they, they have that pastor. I can't, I ain't, I ain't cut out. I'm real over You know, I think to Ezra, when you're talking about that, because he he stuck to what God said to do, even in spite that, um, like there were Jewish people that were intermarried and things like that, and, and things were kind of looking gloomy, but then all of a sudden, he wakes up and he says, wait a minute, there's a remnant. God, yep. he, he has us on a purpose, and he kept with it. Yep. Yeah. How much in this time we're coming into do we need a place like that? Places all over the country yeah. like that. Yeah. Where people can come and hear the word, the gospel taught to them. A place if they're sick, they can go and have the word taught to them about healing, where they can learn to receive their healing, and can get a free meal every day. That's right. I mean, we need them places all over the United States right now, because I'll tell you, it's fixing to get bad. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not trying to be loom and gloom, but the way our country is going, I think we've done tilt, went over the tilt. Well, you know, gas is up to, oh, y'all y'all need to hear this on the YouTube. Gas is up to, what, $3.15? $3 uh -huh. Groceries has gone up. I bought some coffee today. It's $3 higher than it was 
a month ago. Sure. Things going up, 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 up. Just getting worse and worse. What's going to happen to all these people that ain't got money or has been living off the government? Mm -hmm. When it gets where they can't get up to food, they can't take care of themselves, what's going to happen? They're going to go to stealing and robbing. This whole country, it can turn around within the next year. We could turn around. There ain't no telling how bad we could, uh, much trouble we could have in the United States. Why? Because the devil's doing all this. Yeah. Because we got devilish people in government. Yeah. We ain't got no Christians, no godly people. And if people can't feed their families, how many people here in America went hungry? So yeah. praise the Lord. So you better get, you, you need to get yourself where you can believe God. That's, a, that's what's going to take care of us. Yeah. <clears throat> Believe in this word, what the Lord says. Give it, get in this word, and make it life to you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Everybody blessed? Amen. Praise the Lord. Everybody.